It was deja vu at Footprint Center on Tuesday night as the Phoenix Suns once again beat the Sacramento Kings going small, coming from behind once again. On today's episode of Locked on Suns, why those lineups are working, how they can get even better, and what this win means as the playoff chase heats up. Let's go. You are Locked on Suns. Your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at suns.com and the host of the Just Basketball Show wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen post-game after a big Suns win at home, 130-125 to 125 over the Sacramento Kings. If you're finding us for the first time, maybe you just have never thought to do it. Hit the follow button, hit the subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you are finding us on. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube. When you hit that button, you get a new show in your feed every single Monday through Friday, which will allow you to become an everydayer and keep up, stay locked on to the Phoenix Suns all season long right here with this show. Again, I know big might not even uh, be the right word. Maybe it doesn't capture how important these wins will be down the stretch of the season. But the Suns pull even in the season series with Sacramento, 130-125. And we're going to zoom in on our moment of the game as we always do, which was the start of the fourth quarter. So, Kevin Durant mentioned that closing the third quarter is maybe the real focus when you talk about these fourth quarters for the Suns. But this is the second straight one against this Sacramento team in which the Suns have appeared to be completely fine when it comes to what we thought of as one of the main issues on the team, which was closing these games out and and winning in the fourth quarter. So the end of the third quarter, the Suns go tiny. They have all these guys who are like six, seven or shorter with O'Neal, Gordon, Little, Booker, maybe Allen. To start the fourth quarter, Durant is, I think, actually a Kogi, not Allen. So then to start the fourth quarter, the Suns go back to Durant, back to Allen. They keep Little in. They keep O'Neal in. And they go on a 16-6 run to open things up, which featured four three-pointers from Durant, Gordon, and Little. Wait, that's only three. And O'Neal. And excellent ball movement. Almost every single shot in this run was assisted. And... That really decided the game. Obviously, Sacramento was able to draw closer toward the end. They even took the lead with about four minutes to go, then again with three minutes to go, then again with 250 to go, and on and on. But without being too simplistic, to me, this stretch decided the game. Whether you want to call it the start of the fourth quarter or really date it back to the third quarter, although score-wise, the The score was tied going into the fourth, and the Suns, really at the end of the third, it was just staying afloat with that tiny lineup. Sort of a fun fact more than a deciding moment. But this really opens the door for a few things, right? And let's start with Durant. These opens to the fourth quarter have been money for him all year. It's it's really, um, honestly, if you have been following this team longer than just this season, it's very refreshing that these stretches go well because the beginning of the fourth quarter in past years used to be no Booker. And can DeAndre Ayton step up? You know, 
Is Chris Paul healthy? Can he step up? Will the shots go in? The bench isn't really doing much. Oh no, suddenly Book needs to save the day. And to have Kevin freaking Durant be the guy to fix that is a luxury that goes beyond luxury. This season, in fourth quarters, Durant is shooting, and look, this is not too far off from his overall season numbers, but 52-46-92 shooting splits. And if that's not good enough, almost two blocks per 36 minutes. He does have quite a few turnovers. I would imagine that a lot of that you would attribute to early in the season, although he already has 11 fourth quarter turnovers in February, which is a weird stat, and that's before tonight, although I'm not sure he had any tonight. So that side of things has been a little hit or miss, but it's been that way for everybody. Actually, I do think he had one in the fourth quarter today, that time when Fox stole it from him at the top of the arc when he was trying to read the floor. So look, that part is the blemish. But the other thing I was going to say that brings us back to these small ball lineups with Durant at center is that he has almost two blocks per 36 minutes in fourth quarters this season. These units are fascinating to zoom in on. First thing is the Lasers lineup, and I should now mention Bradley Beal left this game with a hamstring strain after a very bizarre situation where he checked out of the game and looked fine, and then all of a sudden we're getting a note from Suns PR that he's going to be out. What the hell? I don't know what's going on here. You can sign up for Locked on Suns Insiders to get the alerts straight from me with the latest news about Beal as we monitor the injury through the All-Star break. The link to sign up and join that community of Suns lovers, Suns insiders who are getting my fresh perspective on everything in Suns world and getting to stay in the know about the Suns all the time. That link is in the show description below, or you can go to join subtext.com slash locked on suns. But that lasers lineup is the only one that's played mu- played enough together to really get a read on. So that's part of it. All these different, you know, there's a lineup that's played 16 possessions together where Bates Diop is at the four instead of, of Gordon. Or I guess actually in place of Beal act it, it is more what I should have said, you know. So that's part of it. But it's also that Lasers lineup, the only one of these small ball units that's been good. <laughs> that's that's really worked. I sorted in cleaningtheglass.com, which has good lineup stuff. I have it to filter only to look at lineups with Durant on the court and zero of Eubanks, Nurkic, Azabuki, or Metu. And still, those lineups on the season have a minus 15 net rating. They have not been able to defend at all, and the offense has been hit or miss. When Kogi's out there, for instance, when Bates Diop is out there, Little is out there, things have gotten pretty ugly. On the other hand, when the more shooting, some of the bowl bowl lineups, you can see some good numbers. So definitely something to monitor. In this game, they they worked. And obviously, going forward, as we saw tonight, where Royce O'Neal is basically playing point center, defending DeMontis Sabonis and initiating offense on each side of the floor, that's one ingredient that they did not have before. Being able to try it out with Bowl if the matchup calls for it is an ingredient that they haven't had most of the season. And of course, Thaddeus Young, who I will talk about um, later in the week once we hear a little bit from Vogel about him and then uh, get an off day to really focus on it as the signing becomes official hopefully soon. That's another ingredient. So there's reason to believe this will get better, but 
The bottom line today, as this stretch showed, is that when you need to keep up with a high-powered offense, when you need to match another team that maybe is going a little bit smaller and more spaced out, the Suns have that option. In fact, I would say it is one of the things that is materializing into what their identity is going to be. I don't mean to take a victory lap here, but I said this basically from preseason. I felt decently about Nurkic, but I did not feel great about Eubanks or Metu or Bol Bol as big man backups. I still don't think that's really what Bol, what you would consider him. And I felt like this team was going to be offense first and their small ball looks were going to be a big wrinkle in, in what made them a special team, what made them a different team, what made them difficult in the postseason to match up with. We have not seen the final ingredient in this, which I assumed would be some junk defenses, some zones, some box and ones, some, you know, over, overhelped get the ball out of so-and-so's hands for so-and-so to shoot types of things. And we maybe are still headed toward that in a postseason environment. We haven't seen it much yet. So the reality is these units do not defend very well, but it, it doesn't really matter when they score like this. This game drew the Suns even out of four games against Sacramento this season with only 30 or so games to go in the NBA season. We are rapidly approaching the stretch run, and that means seeding is coming into play. So let's talk about what this win set the Suns up for and what to watch for there as our big takeaway from this Suns W next First, today's show brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with that 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Keeping the show rolling. Seeding, right? So the Suns are now 2-2 two and two against Sacramento this year. They have five games against them because this was one of the teams that they played in the NBA Cup. Coincidentally, both of the teams they played in that tournament in the knockout round ended up being division opponents. So they also have five games against the Lakers, of course, which I believe the, the, the last one of is the Sunday after the All-Star break. That's... Not as pertinent because the Lakers are not winning right now, but that is where the Suns stand with the Kings. After tonight's game, they are a game and a half above Sacramento. Really two, it feels like, right? I mean, they're one game ahead in the loss column, two games ahead in the win column. Doesn't that equal two? Whatever. They have, with this win, separated themselves from the Kings. They are even exactly an identical record to the Pelicans. And the Mavs are the team sitting in between Phoenix and New Orleans and Sacramento. And then the Lakers and Warriors are another tick below that. I wanted to use the opportunity, though, because this was both a tiebreaker type of game. If the Suns had lost this, it would have clinched the Kings having the tiebreaker in head-to-head. But the tiebreaker that goes above that is division winner. So let's focus in on that really quickly. The Clippers are going to win this division if they stay even close to healthy. And Kawhi is missing Wednesday night's game. We'll see if that lingers. But I tend to feel like their depth is good enough to even survive that with a five-game cushion against Phoenix. So, 
That's the number one tiebreaker. Even if the Suns were to tie with the Clippers, the head-to-head is going to favor the Clippers. Point is, that's locked in. So, you would expect, because of this other wrinkle, which is that the Wolves, the Thunder, and the Nuggets are all in the same division... doesn't have to end up this way, but the Clippers are bound to finish higher than the Suns and the Kings. The winner of the Northwest Division is going to be at the top within those standings. And the other part of it is the division winner clinches the tiebreaker even if you're not in the same division. Little weird because again, the top five teams are all out of these two divisions. So it wouldn't be impossible for the Northwest teams, Minnesota, OKC, and Denver, to all finish one, one, two, and three, and then Clippers four, Suns five. That's legal in terms of how all of this stuff ends up looking. We talked about the head to head. The Suns do have three games left against the Clippers, I believe. So I guess that's not fully decided, but the Suns would have to sweep those in order to get that. And, uh, oh no, they play, they play two more games against the Clippers. They've already played two. So the Suns have to win both. But again, if the Clippers win the division, you know, so that's where I'm at with that. The next one after division winner and head-to-head record is division record. So even if you are not the winner of your division, how did you fare in the games within your division? So this is where things get a little bit interesting because the Suns have played four more of those games than the Clippers. They have played five more of those games than Minnesota and Denver, and they've played the same amount as Oklahoma City, but the Thunder are off to the races in that category with a 10-4 and division record. As a reminder, you play 16 division games. So the Suns have already played 14 of those. That doesn't even sound right. It's different this year because they played the Kings and the Lakers twice apiece. So they played, they will play 18 and they've played 14 of them. So again, two more against the Clippers. They have one more against the Lakers, one more against the Kings. And that's, that's going to be that. It's hard for me to imagine that the Suns are going to be able to compete with Minnesota, who is seven and two. OKC, who is 10 and 4, or the Clippers, who is who are 7 and 3. But again, a lot of this only comes into play if you are tied with those teams. The biggest factor here is the Suns are in the big picture of the overall standings. Four full games in the loss column behind Denver, five behind the Clippers and the Thunder, and six behind Minnesota. They are going to have to play absolutely elite basketball to have a chance at any of these tiebreakers to matter, to end up with an identical record to these other teams. And the maybe more important thing is the Kings tiebreaker is likely to favor the Suns. The Kings have a 6-6 and division record. That last game will be important, as will the Lakers game soon. The Pelicans, the Suns, I believe, will play one more time. Be nice to win that one and get that tiebreaker. They already won the first game. They match up well with that team. And the Suns own the tiebreaker against Dallas. As of now, they are 2 and 1 against Dallas? No, they are they are 1 and 1 against Dallas. They do need to win that one and be able to assemble a advantage over the teams below them. If 
it sounds like I am maybe being confusing. I don't think I am. It's just that this is so crowded once again. The Western Conference was decided decided by a handful of games last year. It looks like it's headed that way again this year. And the Suns are basically right where they ended up last time around, right? They're going to be on the road to start the proceedings and they're going to have to beat some great teams once again to get through it. But there's still hope to get into that top four, even if it's a long shot and you have to feel pretty good given the Suns track record against New Orleans, Dallas and Sacramento already this season that those teams are not likely to pass them up. We might just be headed toward a Suns five seed. And the reason I broke down how those other teams stack up against each other and pointed out how Minnesota, OKC, and Denver are all all in the same division themselves and will play each other more down the stretch is that's probably the most important thing to keep track of. Who are the Suns going to play in the first round? Who might they play in the second round? And how do those teams all look? Because five might be the destiny. Let's close out the show with a NERC report from this game. A box score oddity from this game. And a few other odds and ends. First, today's show brought to you by Hungry Root. Honestly, just an awesome company to talk about I don't I don't know if it's just me but it sounds delicious it sounds healthy I'm in grocery shopping and meal planning for specific dietary needs or preferences can be challenging we all know somebody maybe you are somebody who struggles with maybe an allergy maybe a high protein diet. Maybe you're trying to bulk. Maybe you're trying to cut weight. Maybe you're just trying to eat more nutritious things. And I think we can all relate to that. The day, the days are officially getting longer. And while there may be a bit more daylight, Hungry Root can add some of that time back. Customers save five hours per week using Hungry Root without the stress of grocery and meal planning. You also don't have to eat out as much when you have your meals planned and prepared and ready to go for you. Hungry Root can help save up to 30% on food waste and make your community a little more healthy. And with our discount code, you save even more money, 40% off and free veggies for life. Hungry Root is your partner in healthy living. Take a fun short quiz and Hungry Root will get to know your personal health goals, what you have in the kitchen and more. Hungry Root will then recommend recipes and groceries based on your personal taste. But again, each order is fully customizable, so you can take their suggestions or just choose what you want. Everything from Hungry Root follows a simple standard. It's got to taste good, be quick to make, and contain whole trusted ingredients. Right now, that promo code to save a ton of money and get free veggies for life is locked on. Visit HungryRoot.com slash locked on to get 40% off your first delivery and your free veggies forever. That's HungerRoot.com slash locked on. H U N G R Y R O O T.com slash locked on. Don't forget to use our link so they know we sent you. Closing out the show with a NERC report. That is where I give you my insights straight from Footprint Center about what on earth Yusuf Nurkic was up to in this game, in any game. If you want more of my insights on game days, you can sign up for Locked on Suns Insiders where you get text messages straight to your phone with today. I posted a photo for the Locked on Suns Insider community just showing how tall Royce O'Neal is on a court so people can gauge it. I believe he's about 6'6". There are some Nurkic observations from time to time, photos, videos, different little things that I see in here around the arena on game nights as well as just my takeaways, my thoughts, injury updates, and more. You can go to joinsubtext.com slash LockedOnSuns or click the link in the show description below. But 
It was interesting with Nurkic tonight, right? He, at one point, was not pleased with the foul call early, uh, late in the first quarter, I want to say. And he's standing on the free throw line using former Suns lottery pick Alex Len's body to show the ref how the contact affected him. So him and Len are bodying each other for a rebound under the basket. Nurk feels like he got fouled. Rather than just barking at the ref, he like kind of rubs up against Len to show exactly what it looked like in real time to the ref as Len just looks at the basket waiting for the free throw. That was a good one. Um, Coming off of Nurk versus Draymond part two the other night, we got Nurk versus Sabonis part four, and those guys bother the hell out of each other. Sabonis is one of the most frustrating players to play. I know I've said that before because they've played each other so often this season, but the dude, honestly, I think he's one of those players where you could call him for a foul maybe 75, 80% of the time, whether it's a rebound, whether it's him contesting a shot, defending in the post, going up for a shot himself and using his shoulder to create space. There are no shortage of physical plays when you are going up against that guy and Nurkic was over it. Nurkic was fed up um, and let everybody know about it. There was one play where uh, I I think it was one of the 50, 50, there was a few that I don't think the Suns used their challenge, but there were a few where they could have And Nurkic just stared lasers through the back row of assistant coaches who normally are watching the video replay. The the game had already started back up by that point, and Nurkic is just entertaining the courtside seat sitters by very dramatically just dogging that row of assistant coaches like, can you believe this is happening? Why did you guys not tell Vogel to challenge this? So those are some of the funny ones. Trust me, if you ever go to a game, you don't even have to be sitting close. Just watch this guy between plays, when he's on the bench, whatever the case may be, and you are bound to be entertained. But the real thing to focus on, and I might even just look, this the the um stat, what the heck do I call it? Why can I not think of the phrase? Probably because it's 12:30. The stat of the day is that the Suns somehow limited Sacramento to only attempting 31 threes. They also attempted 31 themselves, the Suns did, and made four more. That's pretty impressive. You add up the um, 11 more three point or 11 more free throw makes and 12 more free throw attempts, which is basically just Devin Booker in a package. And it's pretty clear how the Suns were able to win this game. But to close out on the Nurk side of this and and finish up our Nurk report for the day. The funniest thing about this whole game, or the most, uh, honestly, not even, not even ha-ha funny, but most impressive thing about Nurkic is that despite all the craziness, he gets benched for the biggest stretch of the game, where the Suns make that run early in the fourth quarter, as I laid out earlier. He comes back in, in the fourth quarter. I, I don't really know, honestly, why Vogel did this. Um, He he comes in at the four minute and six second mark. The Suns are down one. He immediately gets a strip. He then has a... He made a play on the offensive end. It may have just been a, a good screen or a good pass. And secures... Uh, He gets another steal later against Monk, blocks De'Aaron Fox on the very Drew Eubanks-esque block, and is just able to involve himself in a game that, as I said with my main takeaway, was defined again by small ball stretches. Nurkic comes in for three minutes when the game is very much still undecided and is not only able to be playable, quote-unquote, which is a word we throw around a lot, but actually makes an impact, like creates turnovers, tangibly affects the outcome of the game. And that's huge. You know, KD was asked about it post game and he was like, that's what veteran players on great teams 
have to do. They have to have that mentality to the game goes away from them, they make mistakes, their shot's not falling, whatever it is, and they still need to be ready and engaged to come out and do what needs to be done. And that might sound like, well, yeah, great, you no know, duh, everybody has to do that. But the reality is, not everybody does do that. So Nurkic deserves some credit. Um, he's a goofball, he does weird stuff, he can, he can let his emotions get the best of him from time to time. It never gets out of control, and he always is able to channel it into production on the court, and that's all you can ask for. I don't feel like I talked about Royce O'Neal enough tonight, but it didn't really fit. I did do the point center point earlier. I would imagine we will get a dose of O'Neal on Wednesday night when the Suns take on the Pistons in the second night of this back-to-back because Bradley Beal is again out. Grayson Allen hurt his left hand. I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up questionable. All those injury updates at the Locked on Suns Insiders, a recap show here on the Locked on Suns podcast feed. Sign up for both. You know what to do. More content to come. Enjoy the game on Wednesday and Monty Williams return to the Valley. And I'll catch you guys after that.